Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 441. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. I'm also a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on the network, please visit evergreenpodcasts.com. So this week's interview is really special. It's with Brant Menswar, who's a speaker, author, performance coach, specialized in helping people and organizations discover, align, and activate their non-negotiable values to increase performance. On top of his life as a bona fide rock star for 20 years, Brant brings an energy and conviction that is entirely palpable. His book, Black Sheep, Unleash the Extraordinary or Inspiring Undiscovered You, came out in September 2020, and it's a powerful read for anyone looking to sort through the chaotic messiness that is life. In this conversation with Brandt, we discover his journey to finding his black sheep, the ability to deal with the messy spirituality, finding one's deepest and most earnest values, and becoming a conscious creator. We also get an inside look at a new venture Brandt is launching to reinvent how we discover books. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. And please do consider to drop in your rating and review. And don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show with Brant. Brant Menswer, I am so happy to have you on my show. I was lucky enough to get to work with you on my last book, You Lead. You are a, a, a primal black sheep. And for those, you can, nobody can see you on this uh, audio recording, but you are all in black, uh, appropriately so as we speak about your new book. Brandt, in your own words, how would you like to introduce yourself? Well, I am a, a former 20-year musician slash rock star uh, converted to a keynote speaker and author and um, focus the majority of my writing and time now helping people discover their non-negotiable values and how to uh, amplify and activate them in their lives. All right, so I have to start with a little um, etymology or at least understanding of your last name. I was thinking it's gotta be something that, uh, uh, you know, it's a rock and roll star's name, Men's War. Mm -hmm. uh, where does that name come from? Tell us. <laughs> uh, it's Polish. And uh, my grandfather changed the spelling so that it was pronounceable uh, in, the, in the States here. Uh, so the actual uh, way that the, the true way to spell my name is M-Y-N-C-Z-Y-W-O-R. Uh, uh, but <laughs> over here, that was like Mitzel Plink. So no, nobody yeah. could say that. Nobody great, wanted to Great for Scrabble. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So he changed it to what it actually sounded like or how people attempted to pronounce it, which was just Menzoir. So I loved your book, your, your book, of Black Sheep, published by our lovely, wonderful friends at, at page two. Mm -hmm. And uh, and frankly, the, 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 there's one phrase or one portion I like the most, and you kind of saved it for the end, where you talk about your appreciation of Mike Iaconelli's book, Messy Spirituality. Mm -hmm. and, and you write, he said, hopelessly flawed and hopelessly forgiven, whose discipleship is blatantly real and carelessly passionate characterized by a brazen godliness. I would love for you to explain your relationship with that phrase. So many, many years ago, uh, I played the Greenbelt Festival uh, in, uh, uh, in England over uh, the racetrack. Uh, and, and it was, uh, Mike Iaconelli used to come and speak. And it was one of the times he was leaving the festival that he was in a car accident and was killed. And so, um, you know, I had read some of, some of his work prior to that anyways, before sort of being a fan of his, um, uh, you know, the stuff he would do at the festival. But in the, the idea of that for me is, is truly just living out your life, how you feel like you were meant to live it out unapologetically. And, um, you know, I, this idea of, carelessly passionate, brazenly God, the, the brazen godliness, the whole, the whole way in which he describes it, it's more about the adjectives for me mm. in that, in mm. that, uh, that quote that really get me, get me going. It, it is something for me that 
if you are going to be unapologetically you, um, then then you need to do it right, and you need and it needs to be consistent, and it needs to be done um, with confidence and in a way that uh, isn't boastful. It, it's mm. just it's just authentic. And I think the uh, authenticity word gets thrown around a lot. Um, I think there's some uh, differences of opinion about what authenticity might actually be. Uh, the work that I do, I require people to define what they mean by what they say. And so mm -hmm. we have some clarity around what authenticity might be to them. But mm -hmm. the idea for me is that um, when you are your 100% true authentic self, it resonates at a different frequency and it connects in a different way to people. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I believe that black sheep recognize black sheep. And so the more real mm. you can be, um, the more you're going to be able to connect in the world. Hmm. Well, as a wordsmith or someone who's been spent a lot of time writing and loving words, I, I, that's why I think I, made that phrase stand out because it's and why I wanted to read it out because it's such a, a powerfully thought through set of messiness and 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 for me I I basically have fallen in love with the concept of messiness it, yeah. it, it, it's such a, a a wonderful way to describe our humanity I agree and I you know I think when you when you mix in um the, the messiness of religion uh, mm -hmm. into a, a, a statement like that, um, especially here in the States and, and on the Christianity side of things, there's this idea that, that you have to be perfect in some way, shape or form. And uh, I just, I, I disagree with that with every ounce of my being, uh, you know, years ago, uh, the band did a, a record called beautiful imperfection. And the idea behind it was, one of the years that that we played Greenbelt, um, there's a gentleman there named Pip Wilson, and Pip is sort of the grandfather of the festival, and and he uh, worked for the YMCA there uh, in England for many 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 years. And we were sitting around one night, it's probably one o'clock in the morning after the festival at the hotel, and and we're sitting around a fireplace having a drink, and um, he was talking to us about uh, wow. uh, sort of our generation, my my generation, he was the the uh, uh, Gen Xers. And uh, he said, you know, here, here's, here's what troubles me about your generation. You could be staring at an absolute masterful painting on the wall that is, that is hanging slightly askew. And you are so compelled to go over and straighten it that you never look at the painting itself. Mm. And, and that to me, um, that thought is it resonated so deeply that we wrote an entire album ab about that idea of the compulsion to go over and try to fix something rather than appreciating um, the beauty of what it actually is. And so, you know, I've, I've made a conscious decision in my life to try to live that way. And I think that messiness and, and, and brazenness and all of those things that come along with it, um, it takes a lot of fortitude to ignore um, the need to try to fix something and mm -hmm. instead just appreciate it for what it is. Mm, that wholeness. That is, I believe there's even a pathology uh, that relates to people's inability to accept a picture on a wall that is hung incorrectly. So it, it is that sort of focus on the, um, on the imperfection as opposed to the, the not perfection, but the whole thing in front of you. Well, in interesting enough, you know, I spent six years pastoring a church and uh, I, when I sort of had this, this concept come to me, I decided one day that I was going to, uh, you know, we had this very large cross that, that, that hung in the back of the church on the wall and I was going to just make it a little askew. And <laughs> so be before anybody got in that day, I made the cross a little askew and uh in the 30 minutes when people started to show up to when the service started, I had four different people go and, and fix it um, without saying anything. And, uh, and, and it made for a really good sermon that day. I bet <laughs> but, it did. but the idea of, of you know, the, the question to me became, what are you looking for? 
are you looking for the faults? Are you looking for yeah. the things that are askew? Or are you, are you looking at the beauty of what I would call God's creation, even if you think it's not perfect? And, um, and, it, and it requires a shift in, in thought process to get there. When I do my own work, I often, I, the, 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 the vocabulary I, I use is about finding your North Star. Mm -hmm. as as a compass as a method through the messiness and and a lot of people get fixated on the north and well actually the big problem is people have too broad an idea of the north they they think they have one but it's just way overboard 25 values to use your mm -hmm. terms or you know, 25 mm -hmm. black sheeps mm -hmm. and and so their flock is too big and and uh and but when you get to making your purpose or your north star it, it isn't necessarily going to be perfectly north. It may not hit a perfect north, but it's better to have something to aim to that is precise, obviously closer to the north, but doesn't have to be spot on 360 degrees or zero, 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 zero degrees. Yeah, our buddy, Jim Knight, um, who uh, uh, has this amazing exercise he does during his talks, he has a, you know, he's in a room full of a, a thousand people giving the, giving this talk at a conference and he has everybody stand up. He has them close their eyes and he says, okay, now what I want everyone to do is I want you to, to point to the North. And so uh, the, the entire room does and he has them open their eyes and everybody's pointing in a different direction. <laughs> and uh, it's this amazing visual confirmation um, that especially as leaders, you, you got to know the direction of which you're going if you want people mm. to have confidence and be able to follow you. And in that same light, um, when it comes to defining the things that matter most to us, if we never take the work to get sort of situated and define where our North Star actually is, how are we ever going to have any sense of direction that we're moving in, in that way? And mm. so for me, you know, the work that we do helps us orientate where we are and know where that North Star is, no matter which way you're facing. Yeah, and then it, you can sort of course correct and 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 even go back and and reevaluate your purpose and adjust mm -hmm. the words as I've done anyway. So uh, let's say permission to be imperfect, even in the journey that is finding your black sheep and finding your purpose. Hundred percent. So um, I was uh, I wanted to throw something at you. Um, I worked in hairdressing for for sixteen years. And so I know a thing or two about dying hair. Mm -hmm. And and so, gosh, there you go. And you say, well, you, you can't actually dye a black sheep's, uh, or black, when, it's, when it, the sheep's wool is black, you can't dye it. Uh, I, but my technically, I was thinking you can bleach it. And I was wondering what your thought was about that, whether bleaching is actually a, a useful tool to have to sort of go back to scratch. That's what I think about it as, or is it just too drying out of the skin or the hair? Well, I have to tell you that I, it's an interesting thought and um, an interesting thought in that dying adds something to the pigment and bleaching removes things exactly. from mm -hmm. the pigment, right? And so um, in that light, it's, it's an interesting thought to me in the, uh, so, so when people first take the black sheep assessment and I, I saw that you, that you actually completed it, which is I fantastic. certainly did. Yeah. Yes. I want and to talk so, about that after. Yeah. And so here, here's what we know, you know, we've had about uh, just over 6,000 people take this assessment since October and you know, what, what the assessment actually does is it begins by presenting you with just over a hundred commonly held personal core values. And it says, look, in a knee jerk reaction, just sort of, if you read the word and it resonates with you, go ahead and select it. And so what we know after all of these people have taken is that the average person selects at least 30 values that are really important to them. And then, and then what we have to do is say, look, the idea behind identifying these things that are really important are to show you how important it is to separate really important from non-negotiable. Uh, I think a lot of times we as humans consider those things to be inches apart from each other, but in reality, they're miles apart 
from one another. And we confuse things that are really important for non-negotiables. When I say non-negotiable, I mean no. And so, you know, as you can imagine, I do a lot of leadership conferences. And when we do this assessment as pre-work and I use the data in my talks, um, you, who would have guessed that 95% of the time leadership is one of the words that people said were their non-negotiable values in this leadership conference. And um, I just have to call bullshit immediately because the, the, the question that I ask them is this, have you ever attended a meeting that you didn't lead? And as you can imagine, the answer is always yes. And if the answer is yes, I say, well, then it's not a non-negotiable. Because non-negotiable means no, mm. which means you wouldn't attend a meeting unless you were able to lead. And so when you have that understanding of what non-negotiable really is, it helps you sort of narrow down this initial mm. group of values that are really important. And so you get into these five different buckets, if you will, you group them together by likeness. So things like sympathy and empathy go in one bucket and things like success and achievement go in another bucket. And before you know it, all those 30 or so words that someone has selected is now neatly categorized into five different areas. Um, and, and those areas are all sort of similar words. And we do that because our value system exists in a hierarchy. And so there are many words within the hierarchy that mean the same thing. And depending upon you individually, sometimes we have to, what I call leveling up to a higher word in the hierarchy to encompass everything you want it to include. Mm. Um, and so we get to uh, these five groups, and you can pick what's the one word, what's the one value you can't live without, and that gets you your initial flock of five. Now, what we know after training and, and, and sort of coaching this many people is that it is incredibly rare to, at the end of the process, have the same five uh, that you started with at the end. Typically, we see a shift of two or three words. Um, we know that two or three of the five that you have said here, my non-negotiables are actually real. They're ones that just resonate with you and have for, for 20, 30, 40 years. And you can give me 20 examples of each over the course of your life as to why they're important. But two or three of them are just complete fabricated bullshit. And, <laughs> and, that, and it comes from a couple of different reasons, right? So one of them is, is that some of us have been conditioned to care for other people's sheep our whole mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. You grew, If you grew up caring for siblings, you grew up caring for an elderly family member or anything like that at all, you've been conditioned to care and take care of other people's sheep. And so sometimes it's really hard to pull apart um, what matters most to someone else to what matters most to you. Um, the second thing would be that uh, you, this influence in the outside world is really having a little too much credence um, in your mm. own life, right? So you're listening to other people's opinions. Extrinsic. Exactly, exactly. And then the last one would be you're sabotaging yourself in some way, shape or form for who knows what reason and not allowing that value to actually come forth. And so when you get to your five, there is a multi-week process of proving what we know is true. And as I look at yours, um, a couple of them really stand out to me and, and, and are right on the money. It, just from, you know, you and I have, have known each other now for the, uh, almost a year and and uh, have had many conversations and um, through your book, through your writing, through your podcast, I've, I feel like um, I know you pretty well. And, um, you know, so, so one of the ones that stood out immediately to me was oneness, which mm. I think if I'm looking at all of the different ones that you have chosen, uh, I would put that at the top of your hierarchy um, from the outside looking in. Mm. Um, your, your sort of pursuit of oneness uh, mm. over the course of your life, and how you treat others, how you treat even your, your business life. It's really about the, this idea of oneness in the middle. Um, and oneness is in the hierarchy of connection. Mm -hmm. And if I was to look at the highest level of that hierarchy, I would put connection at the very top. And so interesting enough, uh, the number one shared value among all humans is connection by a 50% mm -hmm. margin to the next closest value. Wow. So part of why, and this is, this is my, uh, the argument I would make for the level of success that you have had in your life, which is extraordinary um, on every level. Uh, I would argue the reason 
that you have had that level of success is is of is because of your understanding of the need for oneness and because of that when you lead others they are along uh, with you on that journey they're not following you mm-hmm. you have made them feel like they're a part of the journey they're they're an integral mm-hmm. part of the journey they are part of the oneness mm-hmm. and that if if they feel like they're part of the oneness man you can you can have an amazing impact on other people but if they feel like mm-hmm. you're the oneness mm-hmm. <laughs> and every, and, and they have to I'm just follow one. Yeah. you say yeah. um it, you're not going to be as effective a leader as as possible. And so I, my argument would be, and looking at your other's diversity, um, I think uh, e- even in the nature of the business of which you uh, sort of made a mark for yourself for, for many, many, many years with, with L'Oreal, it, I think it screams that as well. Um, you are one of the, uh, of the people who I think uh, expresses gratitude uh, on a daily basis, um, even in conversation, uh, for, for most people, they don't think or to thank of anything or be thankful for things in the midst of a conversation. It, it becomes an afterthought after mm-hmm. sort of the conversation is over what they're thankful for, mm-hmm. but you're very open about, about, um, thanking people for what they're doing and the work they're doing and, mm-hmm. and, um, the impact they're having and whether that's through an email, whether that's through a conversation, all of those things add up to this idea of when people engage with you, when they interact with you, they feel that oneness. And that mm. oneness is so intoxicating. It's so mm. powerful mm. that it makes people want um, to be around you in, in any capacity that they can, they can have, which is both really, really good, really powerful, and potentially really, really dangerous uh, for people who misuse that power. Mm-hmm. And so um, I'm, I've just been incredibly thankful for the, for the journey that um, I've experienced with you and, and, and being able to learn from, you know, from, from your years and years of success. And, and uh, I, it makes sense to me when I saw this, I, it was like a no duh, uh, uh, <laughs> looking at these, um, going through even, even um, timeliness and honor and all those things and knowing sort of your, your love of history and mm. um, documenting of history and all those sorts of mm. things. You're honoring these, these moments and people of the past and, and, and the impact that they've had. It makes sense. You uh, have a level of self-awareness that is um, incredibly acute and, and that is rare these days to see mm. that. Well, I'm flush. We could stop recording now. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, uh, I didn't expect that, Brian, but that was beautiful. Really appreciate that. Um, all right, so moving along, as they say. Uh, first of all, I, I encourage anybody who's listening to go check out your um, your the way you do this on findyourblacksheep.com. It's a really interesting, very quick and easy and thoughtful tool. Uh, so um, that, and then you get an email that gives you some more information about what you just did. So do that, everybody. Um, Black sheep. So sheep in general, uh, another thing that happens with sheep is you often have a shepherd. And um, especially for the white sheep, and maybe the black sheep's the shepherd of the black of the of the white sheep. But I was wondering, you know, one of the things that is also very apparent in your book and the vulnerability that you talk about later on, of course, is your your son, Theo, Mm -hmm. who passed away uh, earlier this year after nine years of, of a battle. And he was the, the drawer, uh, the drawer of your black sheep icon. Um, sure. I was, I was wondering to what extent, if you would, uh, talk about him as being one of your shepherds. Yeah. Listen, um, you know, when you start to have children and, um, you experience your, your capacity for love, uh, in a completely different way. Um, Theo was our firstborn and uh, uh, just a brilliant kid uh, his whole life. Uh, taught himself to read when he was, uh, b- before he turned three years old and mm-hmm. and um, just just an amazing, an amazing kid. And, you know, in the, in the process of him being diagnosed with this rare blood cancer when he was 14 years old and, and the subsequent battle for, for, you know, the better part of a decade um, of him in and out of hospitals and fighting just this battle every day that, that we would never um, understand how difficult it was both physically, mentally, the whole, the whole bit. And 
to have him sort of be as as loving and um just accepting of of everyone around him while at the same time in his way of letting you know that whatever you're going through wasn't shit to him mm -hmm. <laughs> uh in the in the in the nicest way if you wanted to complain about the commute to work he would tell you that he's bleeding out of places that you shouldn't bleed from and right. um you know, it was uh, a chance for him to sort of reset your perspective. And he, oh, God, he yeah. loved, he loved to do that. What I would tell you is that the, the whole impetus of writing this book uh, came from, um, you know, a crossroads that, that we found ourselves with him years ago where the doctors told us he wasn't going to make it through the night and, and, and we had to go say our goodbyes and we sort of weren't prepared for that moment. And so, you know, when the doctor tells you to go, go back to the room and say your goodbyes, you, you, you just do it. Um, because you follow his orders. Yeah. You're the, prof you know, they're professionals. You're just there. You're, you're in this emotional tornado and, and they wear a white so coat. We, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So all of a sudden they know better than, than anyone. And so you just accept it as, as the gospel. And, and, um, that, that was just a mistake on my part to, to allow them to have that much power over me and my life and him and his life. Um, and so, you know, in the, in the process of doing that, um, I found myself fumbling and bumbling in this conversation because how do you have a conversation with your child and tell them that, that you're going to miss them and all these sorts of things. And, um, you know, the, the story is, is one that is just amazing. If you, it's, it's all over the internet, if you if you care to go and look, but, but the short of the story uncle is Todd. this. Uncle Todd, uncle, his uncle um, filmed the video that night. He was 1500 miles away. He couldn't make it in time. And, and so he filmed this video holding up these poster boards, basically begging for help and a Hail Mary, a Hail Mary attempt at trying to find a solution that they said didn't exist. Um, he uploaded that video to YouTube that evening and within 24 hours, it had over 500,000 views and people were sharing it. And I was getting calls from doctors from all over the world who said, Hey, I think, I think I might have a solution. Can I talk to your doctor? And so four doctors ended up putting their heads together and coming up with this crazy plan to save his life. And it worked. And so, you know, in the process of that sort of moment and as excited as we were to, to have him beat it and, and come through that, that, moment of death that we were facing um as happy as i should have been for the next few years uh, i really went to bed every night sort of beating myself up over mm -hmm. one one gnawing question which was i wonder if he thinks i gave up on him mm. and um and i know that i didn't but it was a legitimate question in my head um, and it really sort of shook me to my core that I needed to get my shit together and figure out what my non-negotiables were so that if I ever face a moment like this again, um, I, I don't bumble and fumble my way through and I can speak with authority as to what matters most to me. And that's what started me on this path of discovering these non-negotiable values, which I, I call black sheep because uh, I, I was 47 years old before somebody finally explained to me that um, the reason farmers don't actually value black sheep like the rest of the flock is because their wool cannot be dyed. And so it doesn't have the value per se as the rest of the flock. But when I heard that and, and sort of feeling like a black sheep of myself for many, many years, not in a bad way, I think we, we sort of expect people who are black sheep to feel like an outcast. But I, I will tell you that there's an entire other group of people who have been successful enough in what they've done that they've separated themselves from the pack. And when they've separated themselves, they've had mm -hmm. so much success that they find themselves on an island because the people can't keep pace. Um, well, guess what? They feel like a black sheep too, uh, mm -hmm. but for, for very different reasons, not because they're an outcast, mm -hmm. but because they've outpaced everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so in that light, um, I started to do the, de the deep dive, right? The, the internal um, sort of retrospective as to what are these things that are my non-negotiable values. Um, I need to prove that they're real, that they show up in my life organically. And then uh, once, I, once I knew what those were, I had to start to act with deliberate intention to make decisions that included them and, and mm. sort of foster my action through them. And when I started to do that, everything changed. And so fast forward, uh, until February of this year. And, you know, Theo uh, ends up coming down with COVID in the midst of this pandemic. And um, 
here I am again uh, at his bedside with the same, uh, you know, sort of instructions from the doctor that they that he's not going to make it, and this time they're they're, they're right. Um, but the conversation that I was able to have with him at his bedside this time uh, has allowed me to sleep at night, knowing that I said everything that I needed to say, um, and I said it in you know from from the deepest parts of me that. Uh, mm -hmm. That, that just gave me a second chance. And I was just incredibly thankful to have that second chance. Most powerful, Brent. Um, when I think of sheep, I think most of us would feel insulted if we're called a white sheep, mm -hmm. right? Because who wants to be a white sheep? But it seems like so many people are scared of the black sheep. Mm -hmm. It's like not just the farmer's dismissive <clears throat> un unappreciation of the non-viability. It's that we, we run away from uh, the black sheep. Yeah. We don't want to be outside of you know, the norm. And, and so it, it feels to me, and this has been my experience, that you kind of need to have an earth-shattering experience like you've had to get into, to, to shift into this uh 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 -huh. i need to i need to figure this out i need i need to get with the messy program here i need to understand life isn't perfect but i also need to lean into who i am and what i'm all about mm. yeah it's an interesting uh conundrum right it, 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 so our our desire to connect um mm -hmm. and need in need for belonging mm -hmm. um often allows us to acquiesce to being part of the flock, right? Mm -hmm. No matter what, we just, we wanna be a part of the flock. Uh, and, and if you think through it, uh, um, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You don't really want to be a part of the flock in that way. Mm -hmm. You want to be uh, in the midst of the flock, right. but you know, interesting enough, you know, farmers use black sheep in a very, uh, distinct way. So be, because they can't have their wool dyed, uh, it doesn't mean that they don't possess value. They actually have a lot of value. They just are used in a very different way by farmers. And so farmers keep one black sheep for every 500 white sheep in their care. And they use them as a marker so that every morning a sheep farmer can wake up and look out over his flock. If he has 500 sheep in his care, he doesn't try to, to count the 500 white sheep and make sure he's okay. He looks for five black sheep, that one per hundred. And if he sees those five black sheep, chances are everything is okay. If he doesn't see those five black sheep, he knows that something is wrong. It's famine, it's wolves, there's something happening and he should investigate further, right? Hmm. Um, it's the black sheep's ability to stand out from everybody else that gets the farmer's first look. And what I teach a lot is if you are in business and your personal life, whatever is, if you want someone's first look, you have to be leading with those traits that make you, you and not mm -hmm. everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so if the goal is to get the first look, the best way to do that is to lead with the things that make you that 100% authentic original that you are. Mm -hmm. And that requires you to do the work, right? And that's, that's the, the real challenge. And if we look at the world today and at least in our lifetimes, I've never seen us as divided uh, uh, on, on different sides of extremism, both on the left and the right. Mm -hmm. And what I would tell you is that in, in my opinion, my, my two cent Dr. Phil here, is hmm. that what, what we have is a connection problem, is what we have. And if you look at the extremists on both sides of, of the battle here, the one thing that they do better than anything else is make you feel connected. They make you feel like your voice is heard. They make you feel like you are part of something bigger than yourself. Um, and until those of us who are somewhere in the middle <laughs> mm. make people feel welcome enough that we can have a conversation and they can still be connected without holding on to some such extreme ideas and uh, ideology, um, we're going to find ourselves in this way. I, I, I relate it to dodgeball. Right. If you've ever played dodgeball, <clears throat> you know that you start off on different ends of the court and they put all the balls in the middle of the court. Mm -hmm. And when that whistle blows, everybody sprints and tries to grab a ball. But after they grab the ball, interesting enough, if you watch what happens, 
they don't throw. They get the ball and they retreat. They mm -hmm. retreat back as far as they can. Mm -hmm. And then they start to hurl these balls with every ounce of power they have to try to do damage and hurt the people on the other side. Um, my, my thought was, that's exactly what's happening in today's world, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. We are, we are running to the middle. We are grabbing these values that we say we possess. And we are retreating back and hurling these values at each other with the intent to hurt. Virtue and, signaling. Yeah, 100%. And, 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 and willing to battle over it to say that mm -hmm. this is the way it should be done. So my, my request would be, I'm not, I'm not asking you not to run to the center and, and grab the things that matter most to you. I want you to do that. But when you pick them up, what I want you to do is stand still, stand still, hold your ground and look at the person across from you. Because here's the thing. If you're two feet from my face, I can't really get enough momentum to hurl this at you and hurt you with any, any real power at all. Mm -hmm. But as I'm standing right in front of you, we can actually have this uh, close enough to hand the values to each other and say, hey, take a look at this for a minute and see why we're here. Um, if we would just do that and stand our ground and not try to retreat and get enough distance so that we can gain momentum and power to try to hurt someone and instead stand in the uncomfortableness, stand in that, that area of vulnerability where you could get hit, but getting hit by something that's a foot from you is not going to hurt anywhere near as something that's been hurled from a distance. And that, that um, would be my request and, and how I believe we pull out of this sort of extremist um, society that we're all living in at the moment. One of the things I like to do are run empathy circles. And, and what happens is that I, I get a group of people who don't know one another. It's a structured dialogue where the purpose is to encourage or strengthen empathy and where you are obliged to listen. And at the beginning, they always start off with a sort of bravado presenting the who I am, who I think I am. And then little by little, by listening, it turns out that you feel connected. So it's kind of funny. Just by listening, the other person actually feels more connected to you. And, and so I think, uh, you know, let's say in the middle of this dodgeball, our ability to, to listen does require, in my opinion, and something you write about is vulnerability. Because you kind of need to be open to listening and not needing to jump in and, and push back and retort and have the generosity to give the time for the other person to express himself. So I, I, I've... Uh, not had a chance to participate in in any of your empathy circles, but I do know that you host them occasionally on Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the interesting thing for me with Clubhouse is what a platform, um, there's two, two, two thoughts. First is what an incredibly powerful platform to uh, connect without any other aid of visual anything. It's just sort of, we're only going to connect via audio and, um, a little bit more control over who's speaking when and how people interact and all those sorts of things. So incredibly potentially powerful platform. But my experience mm. <laughs> of getting onto Clubhouse was a pontification of epic proportions of every single person um, on there is a coach, is a expert in this or this and that. And, and in reality, you know, they don't do any of these things in real life. It's an idea. It's a hope. It is, I, I equate it to going to, to university for the first year, right? When you mm -hmm. get out of high school, when you get out of high school, uh, if you're like me, and I, I can't imagine that we haven't all had this thought is I can reinvent myself. Nobody's going to know who I am when I go, you know, away to school. And if I didn't like the things or that people said about me or whatever, I can change those things and, and start fresh. And I felt like that's what happened every time I got on the clubhouse where people were trying to start fresh with their lives and, and it weren't vulnerable enough to just be honest and, and truthful mm. and open to say, Hey, you know what? I work at CVS and I, mm. I work uh, the third shift and it sucks. And mm. I would do anything to get out of this and, and have a different life. And I'm just here to try to learn a little bit to maybe find, you know, show me a path out of the life that I'm in right now. 
but instead it's, I'm a coach and I'm a professional this, and I'm an expert that, and, and there's nothing to back it up. It's not real. It's just a facade. And, um, and, and I love the fact that you get people to break through all that stuff and just be open and honest with strangers to mm. say, um, you know, I'm not alone. Uh, and we're, there's more than just me who are going through something like this and experience something like this. And if nothing else, the mere idea that you are not alone is a really powerful one. Mm. At the end of every session where you speak for five minutes, there's a uh, ritual, which is uh, assuming you have the feeling, I feel heard. Mm. And then you pass along. It's a very beautiful thing. And uh, you mentioned this idea of hoping to create yourself. And in your book, you talk about the unconscious creator mm -hmm. relying on sheer chance and fortune. And as I was reading that, Grant, I, I thought of Monopoly. And I, so I, I, I thought of chance and fortune. I had to check what the other box was. You have chance and you have community chest. And I was thinking, huh, I guess that's like playing Monopoly and hoping that you always get a good chance and a good community chest. Hope, so hope is not a strategy. No, so true. Gosh, I love that. Uh, you know, I lived the majority of my life as an, as an unconscious creator. Um, creativity is what was one of my black sheep and, and one that I have honestly made a living at for decades, whether it's mm. music or, or whatever it might be. And, you know, what I'm doing now and, and, uh, uh as a speaker and author and, and now creating this new app that we've got coming out, it, it's, it's the physical manifestation of my black sheep that allow me to produce creatively um, and be a conscious creator. Now I'm actually doing things with deliberate intention. I'm not just creating and hoping that something connects. Um, I'm building the connection into the creation from the start and that it just produces results on a completely different level. So you just mentioned this app, Brant. What can you tell us about this? I know it's an exciting project. It really is. And um, you know, you've been a part of it uh, without even knowing you've been a part of it this whole time because of our work uh, that we've done to promote uh, you lead and, and just the, the incredible book that you had written. And for us, we, in the process of being authors and trying to get your book in front of readers and, and get them to notice, you know, they, the sort of traditional ways of marketing books are just antiquated and they don't really allow for uh, some of today's biggest and best connection-based platforms. And so we saw an opportunity to create something new. And so we created um, a book discovery platform, an app that is disguised as a dating app. And so rather than match people with people, we match people with books. And so we have a staff of writers that take a book. Um, we've pulled nine questions from actual real life dating apps, and we craft the review of the book and the answer to those questions. And so what we do is we allow you to emotionally connect with a book like you would a person um, and decide whether or not you want to take that book on a date. Uh, it's called Buki Call. Uh, and it's called Buki Call because just uh, like a dating app, uh, not only can you browse through profiles of books and look at ones that have been matched to your profile, um, but twice a week in the middle of the night, you get a Buki Call from the app that says you up. And then it gives you um, a couple of potential matches that lead with what we call the tease, which is just 150 character description of the book, um, trying to get you to say that you would be interested in pursuing this a little bit further. And so you can click on a link and read the profile and, and swipe right or swipe left based on, on your interest level. Um, it is a, a, a revelation of how we interact with books. Uh, you actually can have an AI conversation with the book uh, to your level of interest. And for us, um, that to me, this app has been that manifestation of my black sheep, which are creativity, hope, impact, empathy, family, and authenticity. Um, you are experiencing all of my black sheep in this app. Uh, because I built them into it um, as, as it was. And Jim Knight and myself, my business partner, um, you know, we've been really diligent about making sure that this app uh, isn't just fun, 
um, but is it actually uses the the best recommendation engines we can get our hands on. And, and each time you say yes or no, it gets smarter and smarter and continues to get you better recommendations. And by the uh, uh, September 30th uh, is when this thing launches and hopefully uh, it'll be available on both iOS and Android. And you can download it yourself and, and start uh, dating books. Absolutely fantastic. I believe that's a, Oh, it's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. That was the TV show. Brent, could have gone on, but I want to respect your time. How can people get in touch with you, follow you, get your book? Uh, and of course, get on the Buki call. <laughs> uh, any social media, you can follow me just at Brant Menswar uh, is the easiest way to get me there. Uh, BrantMenswar.com uh, is the website there too. Find Your Black Sheep is a chance for you to go and take the assessment if you'd like to. And uh, I'm pretty active on social media. So if you want to connect, you're connecting with me, not a team of people in front of me. It's just me. Uh, so I'd love to uh, hear from you and how I might be able to help. Brant, thank you for being you. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show and would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minter Dial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on MinterDial.com. Check out my documentary film and four books including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. I like the feel of a stranger Tucked around me, precipitating the danger To feel free, trust is a reason Still I won't tell the lie I sit here passively, hope for your respect Anticipating the thrill of your intellect Maybe I tell myself, there's no use in me lying I'm a convinced man building an urge I'm a convinced man to live and die suburb A convinced man in the arms of a woman I'm a convinced man challenge my fate I'm a convinced man competitions in me A convinced man in the arms of a woman Despise revenges and struggle with deceit Live for the challenge so life's not incomplete What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why i'm a convinced man practicing my lines i'm a convinced man here in these confines a convinced man in the arms of a woman i'm a convinced man to the test I'm a convinced man I'm ready for an arrest I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman